Hi, we're here with Dr. Zubrin of the Mars Society today. Um, hi, good morning. How you doing, Dr. Zubrin? Just fine. Glad to be on your show. Thanks for thanks for being here. Um, so, um, what did you think of the proceedings at the recent Mars Society conference? Uh, well, I thought they were uh, pretty interesting and pretty exciting. We had uh, two very lively debates and a lot of good um, plenary talks. One of the plenaries that I found most interesting was Carol Stokers, who did a review of all the evidence of supporting uh, the search for life on Mars uh, from the assortment of recent probes. Um, and it amounted to a pretty impressive body of evidence um, that I've never seen marshaled quite like that before. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the debates did come off rather well this year. Yes, they did, uh, especially since both sides showed up. You know, yeah. the previous years, you know, for instance, trying to debate Franklin Chang Diaz, who runs around making all these statements about how impossible humans to Mars missions are without his technology, he would never show up for the debate, even when we had it in his hometown. Uh, but on this one, both Boss Lansdorf and the MIT team showed up, and the lunar advocate Harrison Schmidt showed up, and the Planetary Society showed up, and of course I showed up. So uh, this time uh, we had this dialogue, and you know people could sort it out for themselves. I think this is absolutely necessary. We've had too many decisions made in the space program without adequate discussion. It just comes down. So we got stuck with the space shuttle and the space station, and and now the asteroid redirect mission, which lacks rationality. Uh, these things we're going to have more debates at our conferences from now on. Good. Um, so, um, what are the future plans for the Mars Society? Well, uh, the next conference is going to be in Washington next September. Uh, between now and then, we are holding a contest on the Gemini Mars mission the two-person Mars flyby mission, uh, and which uh, we call Gemini, not just because there's two people on it, but for the same, because I think it, it's meant to serve the same role for humans to Mars as Gemini served for Apollo. It's the precursor. It's, it's the first step. Awesome. So um, what do you think of the um, current state of private efforts to go, go to Mars? Of private initiatives? Yeah, like Mars One, mm -hmm. any other? Well, okay, I mean, look, Mars One's fundamental problem is that it lacks the resources to do a human Mars mission. Um, the uh, And Dennis Tito has kind of fallen by the wayside. That's why we're picking up the ball ourselves on this two-person Mars flyby mission. Uh, the, the course initiative financially strong and has real hardware and real technical capability. And they're making some pretty impressive progress. Um, up till now, they've shown that they can develop launch systems and capsules and other space systems for about one-tenth the cost and one-third the time that has become accepted in the aerospace industry. Um, but they've only done things that other people have done, albeit at greater time and cost. But if they can succeed in reusing the first stage, and they're very close to achieving that, they will have done something that no one has done. And uh, then we can start talking about heavy lift boosters with a reusable first stage and greatly reduce the cost of humans to Mars. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so uh, what do you think could, uh, what do you think would be some good sources for funding? Well, see, I think that if you were going to do something like Mars One, that reality TV show is nowhere near what is needed to fund humans to Mars. And furthermore, if you're going to go to Mars one way on a settlement program, you don't just want the money to fund the first mission. You have to have a funding organization in place to keep funding missions sending more people, more supplies, more equipment, more of everything. Um, so really what something like Mars One needs is not a reality TV show, 
but uh, a global Mars settlement support organization, um, which, you know, I mean, look, I've got a billion people, excuse me, we have seven billion people on the planet, about a billion live in the advanced sector or people have money that they can spend on, you know, all sorts of things that aren't directly connected to bare survival. And I would say easily one in 10 of those people in the advanced sector uh, believe that it's important for the human future that humans expand into space. So that's 100 million people, at least. 100 million people times $100 a year would be 10 billion a year. That's more than enough to fund a Mars colony. But we got to pull that together. The harvest is plentiful, but the gatherers are few. Um, and uh, so that, that's ultimately what's needed. Awesome. Yeah. And if um, somebody offered you the money to send man missions to Mars, how would you do it? Well, um, I believe, well, it depends how much money. Uh, if I had uh, very large amounts of money like NASA does, I would fund round trip missions first to do exploration before I started a settlement. If I had much more limited money, say the kind of money that Bas Lonsdorf hopes to get, which is six billion to start and a couple of billion more a year after that. And the one way become uh, necessary because it is much cheaper and less technically challenging than the round ship mission. Uh, but what uh, I would do is, is, you know, I would probably use a launch vehicle like the SpaceX Falcon Heavy and you'd probably use two launches per mission, one to launch the payload, the other to launch a trans-Mars injection stage, make you dock and go. Uh, and uh, and you want to, you know, every two years there's a window of launch to Mars, so you'd launch uh, a group of people and a package of uh, containing supplies and equipment of all sorts every two years, uh, you know, um, very early on, you want to build up your greenhouse capability so you have a farm on Mars waiting for people, um, you know, um, so that you have the ability not to be completely self-sufficient on Mars, but to be self-sufficient on Mars in, uh, in simple but heavy things like food, and later things like iron, Mars is plenty of, steel, plastics. Uh, and then you just import from Earth the very sophisticated stuff, electronics, this kind of thing that, that takes a much more sophisticated division of labor to build, but which doesn't weigh very much. Um, you know, and the key, of course, to the Mars settlement is the ability to take Martian raw materials and turn them into resources. People are confused on this point. There's no such thing as a natural resource. There are only natural raw materials. It is humans who are resourceful. Okay? Land was not a resource until people invented agriculture. And through advances in agriculture over the ages, and most especially in the past two centuries, we have greatly multiplied the value of land as a resource by making it vastly more productive. Last year, the state of Iowa grew more corn than the entire United States did in 1947. Uh, when the United States was already an agricultural giant. And people in the 1940s grew vastly more than the first agriculturalists. Um, and so we multiplied it. Oil was not a resource until we developed petroleum drilling and refining and things that could use the products. Uranium wasn't a resource until we developed nuclear power. Ethereum is not much of a resource now, but it will be once we develop fusion power. So we go to Mars, we have to figure out how to take the stuff that is there and turn it into resources. How to take Martian ground and turn it into agricultural land. Okay, how to uh, take Martian subsurface heat, which is there, we know that because there are volcanoes on Mars that are younger than 10% of the life of the planet, and turn it into geothermal power. Uh, you know, how to take all these different things that exist on Mars and turn them into resources. And then once you do that, then there'll be resources on Mars and people will be able to settle there. So the first people there will explore to assess what is there. 
the next people there will be engineers and agriculturalists to figure out and implement the transformation of these raw materials into resources. And then, after those pioneers, we send the settlers en masse. I see. So, you've had opportunities to testify before Congress. Um, how receptive do you think they were to your message? Well, they were fairly receptive, actually. And one of the outcomes, not just of that hearing, but of stuff that not only I, but other people who think like me or somewhat like me uh, were doing at that time, which was after the Columbia accident, was making it clear that if you're going to have a manned space program, if you're going to take on the risks and costs of manned space flight, you need to have objectives that are worthy of the risks and costs of manned space flight. And out of that came the Bush vision for space exploration, which unfortunately did not move fast enough and thus let itself be, not let itself, made itself um, vulnerable to cancellation once the political leadership changed. You know, a Humans to Mars program, if it's done by the government, is something like an army on the march through hostile territory subject to ambush at any time. Okay, so you don't want to take your time going through those ambush uh, uh, threatening valleys. You want to move through them quickly. Uh, you know, uh, it's like the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea in the book of Genesis. You just can't take your time doing that because uh, budget is going to run out and the waters are going to come together on you. So uh, Kennedy did it right. Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon, we're going to go in this decade and as a result by the time the administrations changed we were practically at the moon and it couldn't be canceled. Bush did it wrong in 2004 saying we're going to be on the moon by 2020. Okay, he really had to understand that he had till 2009 to get this thing well underway or it was uh, probably not going to happen. And so if this is going to be done by a government program, it, you can't go to Mars in 30 years. You can't go to Mars in 20 years. You got to go to Mars in 10 years or less, or, or you're more or less guaranteeing that the political constellation that allowed you to launch the program won't still be in place when it's time to do it. Of course, Sam. And uh, what do you think of current plans to terraform Mars? Well, terraforming Mars, of course, is for the future. Uh, we're not going to terraform Mars in our time. What we can do is establish that first human foothold on Mars. But someday, when there is a new branch or perhaps several new branches of human civilization on Mars, I think they will terraform Mars. Uh, it is the nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into those that are friendly for the development and propagation of life. That is why life has been a success on Earth. Life has radically transformed the Earth. You know, oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere is an artifact of life. There was no oxygen here before there was life. It's photosynthetic organisms created the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and symbiotic communities of plants and animals have transformed the earth, has created the soil, has moved up and colonized lands from the seashores, up the plains, up the hills, up the mountains, as far up as life can go, it goes. And no sooner does any desert place appear on the surface of the earth. You know, think of Hawaii coming out of the Pacific Ocean. Mm, an island is born, a bare, sterile basalt. Birds fly over, they drop seeds, the place becomes lush. Then Polynesians show up and look loose pigs so there's something good to eat. And then Europeans show up and build hotels so there's a nice place to check in. Okay, this is what we do. And it would be unnatural as humans, as basically the kind of bird that the biosphere has evolved that can take the seeds of light from this planet and transform it to barren islands out across the oceans of space, did not do that ourselves. So we will do that someday. But that is not for our for those who will follow us. But what we can do in our time is transform Mars, making it habitable, not so much through a physical transformation, but through an intellectual transformation. That is by developing the technologies that through their existence, transform Martian raw materials into resources that can support human settlement and human civilization, which in the fullness of time 
will grow in size and power to the point where it could terraform Mars. Yeah, if, if we find any evidence of uh, past or present life on Mars, um, what do you think the response should be? Oh, well, the response should be uh, multifold. Um, first of all, I think it should uh, encourage space exploration and settlement, both to find out more about life on Mars and perhaps life that might be elsewhere, Europa, Ganymede, so forth, uh, under the ice there. Um, but also simply telling us that the universe is alive, that the Earth is not the only world. Um, you know, that we, we now know that there are planets going around most stars. The Kepler Space Telescope has shown us that uh, planets around stars are probably the rule rather than the exception. And since every star has a habitable zone near or far where you have the right temperatures for life and liquid water, if life can evolve wherever it has a decent planet, it means life is everywhere. And since the whole history of life on Earth is one of development from simpler forms to more complex forms, manifesting greater capacities for activity and intelligence and, and ever more rapid evolution, if life is everywhere, it means intelligence is everywhere. It means we're not alone. This is worth finding out. And I, I, and I think simply it enlarges the scope of our thinking enormously. Um, you know, I mean, here we are, it's almost 500 years after Copernicus, and most people still think in geocentric terms. That is, while they may know intellectually that the Earth is a planet, there are other planets, and the, their stars are suns, and so forth, the way they actually think about reality is, this is the world, they call this place the world, not the Earth, it's the world, and this stuff that you see when you look up is the sky, okay? Uh, and the stars and such are just little points of light that decorate the sky. And um, so if someone asks what's so important about space, it's, it's almost an absurd question. It's like someone in some tiny little village saying, what's important about the rest of the world? Uh, you know, and, uh, but people don't get that. I, I think, that by going out to Mars and seeing what's there and, and, and perhaps seeing that what is there shows us that we're living in a living universe, uh, it will greatly expand people's notions of what is important and what is not. And what, the, what is not. You know, there are people who think, and a book was written on this subject about 20 years ago, it was called The End of History. We've reached the end of history. Okay, we had the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Age of Exploration and the Industrial Revolution and even the Information Age. And now we've done everything that's worth doing. And so history is over. Uh, sorry, you missed it. Um, but I don't think, and so, you know, so now there's nothing left to be done but, you know, go to the mall and see what's on sale this week. But the, the, I think there are still great things to be done. I think that we are not living at the end of history. I think we're living at the beginning of history, okay? And that the human race is not old. The human race is young. We are living at the dawn of history, okay? So, you know, as we looking back, we look at human beings leaving the Kenyan Rift Valley as sort of the dawn of history of human race as a global species. So, and so it was, but now we are a global species and we're at the dawn of the history of the human race as a space-faring multi-planet species with the universe open to it. A prospect as comparatively rich to our own as our own is to the condition of those first tribes of hum humans living in our natural habitat, which is the Kenyan Rift Valley. Okay. So uh, what do you think a uh, realistic human civilization civilization on Mars would look like a few generations in? Oh, well, I think the closest analogy uh, in terms of current cultural references is the American frontier. It's going to be Little House on the Planitia. Uh, I think that 
uh, it'll be a frontier culture, one therefore which is extremely pragmatic, looking for practical solutions to new problems, not being bound by bureaucracy and red tape, and this is the way we always used to do it. Um, and there's a great uh, possibilities for human freedom. I don't just mean political freedom, I mean freedom to do all sorts of things uh, that is inherent in that situation. When you know, there'll be nothing in shorter supply on the Martian frontier than human labor power. So you're not going to want to have artificial impediments to people using their full potential, which we have in our society. You know, um, every society is almost always completely blind to its most fundamental forms of oppression. So you know, right now people are looking at, you know, the remains of segregation uh, or male privilege or something and they say, well, we have to, you know, deal with that. But in fact, the, the largest form of oppression in our society is not the remains of segregation or anything of the kind. It's uh, uh, the denial of opportunity to the uncertified. Uh, that is, uh, our own college degree to practice this profession or that profession or the other profession and various other certificates required to do this that or the other thing we've got piles of them um, which uh, restrict entry into various professions and prevent large numbers of people from doing things that they're fully capable of doing except they don't have the paperwork um, so this is exactly the sort of thing that you had in medieval Europe where you know, you couldn't make a shoe unless you went through the apprenticeship and the journeyman and devoted, you know, 20 years of your life to getting into the guild. Um, and which is something that we broke here in Frontier America. You wanted to make a shoe, make a shoe. And if people like your shoe, they'll buy your shoe, period, full stop. The, uh, okay, so I think that when you do have uh, a labor shortage, as you certainly will on Mars, uh, that these sorts of limitations will be unacceptable and people will be allowed to do what they can do. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, if you look today at, um, well, if you think today about a school teacher, who is the school teacher? The public image of a school teacher is a woman and most school teachers, particularly in elementary, are women. But that was not always the case, okay? Um, 200 years ago, large majority of school teachers, almost all, were ministers and were men. Okay, uh, women became school teachers on the American frontier, and then uh, that um, acceptance propagated eastward during the Civil War, uh, when there was a shortage of men to fulfill that role. Okay, and so now it's 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 considered uh, in no way exceptional for a woman to teach public school. Um, so when you have those conditions of, of, of labor shortage, that is in fact liberating. And then furthermore, it's liberating technologically because just as the labor shortage in America put a premium on labor savings devices and thus technological innovations, Yankee ingenuity, uh, so you'll have that on Mars. So for instance, uh, comparatively speaking, useful agricultural land on Mars will be in much uh, shorter supply than it is on Earth because it'll have to be in greenhouses. And so they're going to want to get the maximum yield out of every square meter of farmland that they have. And they won't be able to tolerate people who are putting restrictions on advances in agriculture, like we're seeing right now, people raising all kinds of fits over uh, genetic engineering of plants, even though genetic engineering of plants is actually, we've been doing genetic engineering of plants since the Stone Age, except now we can do it with much greater control and efficiency and achieving our objectives uh, by design instead of by chance, uh, no one's going to be killing What if the tomatoes get loose into our cell? No. Um, you're going to say, hey, you've doubled the yield and tripled the nutrition of, of these crops. That's great. And in fact, making inventions like that, which the Martians will be forced to do to meet their own needs, those inventions will be patentable on Earth and improve life on Earth while generating income for the Mars colony. 
Okay, I think a Mars colony will be an inventor's colony because you're going to have a group of technologically adept men and women in a situation where they're forced to innovate and free to innovate, and so they'll innovate. Okay? That's what I think it'll be like. And, you know, at a Mars Society convention a number of years ago, someone, uh, you know, raised this point, which I strongly disagree with, saying, but is it really right to have children on Mars? They'll be living in this little settlement and, uh, you know, instead of having all the cultural enrichments of the earth. And, you know, I brought up the example of Laura Ingalls Wilder growing up on the frontier instead of in Philadelphia or New York or London. Okay, did she have an impoverished uh, childhood? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think she had a very rich childhood. And uh, I think that uh, Martian children will have a very rich childhood too. Uh, and uh, may well develop in much more healthy ways than uh, their counterparts on Earth who are hanging around in wall games. Um, it's the purpose of, 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 of what they want to do. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, what, what are some of the ways that schools could be improved for a better approach to STEM topics? Well, Okay, so uh, moving back to today, uh, I, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I think that uh, we're wrecking our schools right now. We've had a major initiative, bipartisan support, to destroy America's schools through massive standardized testing and massive bureaucratization and massive reportage requirements levied upon the teachers. Uh, my girlfriend is a teacher and she's now working 10 hour days, filling out forms, filling out computer inputs to nominally track the progress of each student, creating piles of data that no one will ever read, okay? Huge amounts of class time being wasted on standardized tests. I think, yeah, we should have a standardized test at the end of the year so we know what's going on, but we don't need to devote 20% of class time to standardized testing. Uh, we're, we're turning our, 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 our these kids into test takers, you know, out goes the science fair, in comes the preparation for standardized tests. And you're not creating scientists, you're creating test takers. Um, you're not creating creative engineers, you're creating test takers, you know. And uh, you're not creating writers, you're creating test takers. Um, the, the, so what you need for education is not an inquisition, you need inspiration. And a Humans to Mars program would be terrific inspiration. It'd be an invitation to adventure to every young person in the country. Learn your science and you could be an explorer of new worlds. And out of that, you'd get kids who teach themselves. You'd, out of that, you'd have kids that go and, 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 and bury themselves in books at the library and start building robots and rockets and telescopes and, and everything. And the, 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 uh, because they want to do this because they'll know that science is the great adventure, and because youth loves adventure, you got to make science the great adventure, and that's what the Humans to Mars program do, do. We would accomplish so much more for education than well, we're accomplishing nothing for education with the uh, uh, Common Core and the standardized test split screen, but we would accomplish so much more for education than you could simply spending the money more constructively directly on education with classroom aids and new textbooks and other things that people, that, that are good things, but um, have nothing like the impact that you have if you can inspire a kid. Awesome. So, um, so basically we need to inspire kids to go into exploration. Um, what, what are some good ways do you think we could do that piece? Um, beyond Mars? Well, once again, it's a question of making science the great adventure, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and because that's what youth is going to want to do. What young people do, they have an instinct. They want to go where people have never gone before. They want to do what no one has done before. They want to build what no one has built before. They want to invent what no one has invented before. That is the healthy spirit of youth. Um, and we show them that that is to be done in science rather than sports and entertainment. 
um, that this is much more significant. That in, in you know here you have a chance not just to be famous but to be famous for doing something that matters, something that's going to matter 500 years from now. Okay, and um, the uh, yes, we need to make science glorious. I'm having trouble with my connection. Um, um, that, that's about all I've got. Um, uh, hey, anything you'd like to add, Dr. Subrin? Well, nothing but, you know, thanks for having me on your show, and let's work together to make science glorious. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you.